Hello, everybody. Welcome to Teal Tinted Glasses Reborn, Episode 4. Uh, tonight is the uh, night you've all been waiting for. Uh, we are pulling out the dead carcass of the San Jose Sharks, and we are going to cut it wide open and see where everything went wrong. Um, with me first is Dr. Um, Dr. Zach Devine. Hello, everyone. I'm ready for the autopsy. And also with me tonight is the wonderful at Hockey Jerk. Uh, I've been preparing for this for uh, the last four years of medical school. I'm uh, I'm ready to get my hands dirty. I, I'm not going to lie. I have no medical training whatsoever, so I'm just slicing in. But you do live relatively close to a Holiday Inn. That's true. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, let's start with, well, where do you start with the an autopsy you start with the head um and in this case the head is going to be the front office and the coaching um so let's start there uh first off what are you guys thoughts on the job doug wilson did over the years zach i'm gonna start with you well i think well hold on i gotta <laughs> just gotta going right in able to actually talk here all right there goes my props all right Okay, I think overall you've you've got to look at the body of work that the Doug Wilson put forward on, on this squad, and I think fans have to be pleased. Uh, you know, the, the the team speed was exposed in the Cup final against Pittsburgh, and that's been well established. The challenge was addressing that. And I think he did that, uh, allowing Roman Polak to walk, getting Michael Bodker as. As scary as those underlying numbers were, it did address a, a team speed issue. So, uh, you know, ideally, they're what they were hoping, some secondary scoring, which didn't come to fruition. But those moves, you have to take a look at and say, well, you know, he, he took a team that went to the Stanley Cup final, tinkered with it, addressed some issues. And so I think overall you've got to look at what he did going into the season and say – he, the the GM did his job. Yeah, I I mean I can't disagree with any of that. Look, when when the Bodker signing happened, I'm pretty sure I was you know here lauding it, and it's easy to look back and with with hindsight and go, okay, you know with Bodker, this is a disaster signing, and it kind of is. But you know I, I I'm not going to go back and say, you know he 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 did the worst job ever i think he i you know I, I i felt that this team on paper was better than it was last year and uh, you know so i as much as things didn't pan out and i don't think that um that doesn't make me happy that things didn't pan out i can't really turn around now and say this was terrible when you know i i was he did everything i you know i didn't like the hansen trade but um other than that, I you know I can't really I, I can't get mad because all, it's all in hindsight. So I don't want to really say he did a terrible job because at the time th that some of the moves were made, I was I was fine with them. I like the Schlemko signing. I like the you know I like the Bodker signing at the time. Um, it didn't work out, but you know here we are. Uh, hockey jerk. You know what I I have no complaints about the job that Doug Wilson did this year. You know team speed like Zach said, was an issue. He brings in Mikhail Bodker. Um, the secondary scoring obviously didn't come to fruition, but you know what? He, at times, helped create some mismatches for a lot of other teams who weren't, um, or who didn't have as much depth in their lineup. And then uh, you look at the signing of David Schlemko, you know, it makes your third pair a little more mobile, and it gives you another option for your second power play unit. Again, you know, something that didn't really work out as much as, we all would hope, but at the same time, you know, he brought in, I guess you would say the right pieces, you know, it's all about moving your feet and foot speed and, you know, creating chances. And I feel like those two guys did obviously uh, getting Brent Burns locked up to an extension as soon as possible was a, you know, a do or die thing for him. I think if he, lo if he doesn't get Brent Burns signed, I think that's the end of everything. Because as we saw this year, the offense runs right through him. And, you know, even the Hansen trade, I mean, obviously Yannick Hansen wasn't, you know, he wasn't a redeem verbata or a Thomas Vanek 
or a insert scoring winger here, but Patrick I thought Eves. he was a, Patrick Eves. There you go. <laughs> but I thought he was, you know, a piece that helped out and kind of, you know, like Bodker contributed to the creating of mismatches against teams that don't have as much depth. And I mean, you know, the three of us all following the Barracuda very closely, obviously salty about losing Goldobin, but at the same time, at the end of the day, I don't think the loss of Goldobin was as big a deal as it was perceived to be at the time. I just think, like, the only issue, like, I have with the, with the Hansen trade, not even just Goldobin, but, I mean, this is a guy who, when the game was on the line, was sitting on the bench. Right. Right? Like, uh, you know, uh, we, we're sending, and we'll get to this later, but you're sending guys on one leg and half a face and out there to play and 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 you know you have Yannick Hansen sitting on the bench and I, I I and I like Yannick Hansen as a player I just I don't know again and again that's more you know that's more hindsight for me I didn't like the trade when it happened I, I'm still not a fan of it now um yeah the, the Hansen trade we, you know it it was risky and I, and I think trying to bring in yeah uh Yannick Hansen when you're already struggling to integrate Michael Bodker you know, he never was going to bring a lot of offense. You know, he, he could certainly chip in. He could be part of that secondary scoring. But that wasn't what the Sharks needed at the time. So right. so if I do have, you know, one critique, um, you know, and Goldobin is as polarizing a prospect as we probably in recent memory for the San Jose Sharks. I don't think so, I've ever had a more polarizing prospect. Yeah. I, I mean, he would be top three in Sharks history, I think. And that would – that would – Agreed. You know, could could easily be number one, but however you view that, you give up a fourth round pick and a boomer bust prospect. I think that's a, that's a fair assessment yeah. um, for really a second third liner that isn't a a difference maker. And we have to remember that if the Sharks had won the Stanley Cup, you know, they would have traded a first. But at that point, okay. everything's moot. They, yeah, they've been the one team out of 29 or out of 30 that actually got the job done. So at that point you'd give up an entire draft class for, a, for you know, for a Stanley cup. Um, but that, that might be my one critique, but even that's lukewarm because I thought Hansen played his role. Well, I'm just not sure that's uh, just another needed. Right. Another depth forward is what the sharks needed. Exactly. Um, you know, actually, it's funny, though, because in the chat here, and it kind of just reminded me, um, something that I wasn't too happy about with Doug Wilson this year is kind of how, now, you know, how, how he kind of mishandled some assets. Um, I, I find it hard to believe you couldn't get anything, a draft pick, something from Matt Nieto when he went, you know, f first waiver claim. Um, I, I don't mind the Wingles trade so much because of the Barracuda on the Barracuda side, but again, I, I think that was another you know, asset that we held on to way too long. So I think that um, the, the holding on to assets too long until their, you know, um, their value is completely diminished, I think is a, is something that soured me a little on Doug Wilson this year. I, I can certainly see that. And I think at, at the end of the day, those are fringe players though. You know, if, right. if Matt Nieto had been able to come in, um, do the job that the Sharks had envisioned for him, we might not have had to, bring up Timo Meyer, mm -hmm. you know, so early in, in his career. And the Sharks, certainly, I think, with Kevin LeBanc, they found that he has what it takes at this level. Timo, you know, we've talked about it at, at length. He's mm -hmm. got all the all the check boxes for a future NHLer. He probably could have utilized a, a full year of seasoning um, in a better deployment, I think. Mm -hmm. But – uh, so Nieto, I, I'm kind of wishy-washy on on where I would have put that. Wingles, I agree with. That's a player that really you, you need to be getting a, a mid-round pick. Maybe not this year, but you know, uh, mm -hmm. a 2018. That that could be. I think that's a valid uh, critique. Jerk, anything? Any thoughts on the Nieto Wingles handling? Yeah, I mean, the Wingles trade, I thought it needed to happen. You know, it was it was just too much salary for a guy who barely could crack the lineup. And right. I do agree, though. I think that Doug Wilson held on to both of them too long. And 
I mean, we can't really be surprised. This isn't the first time it's happened. I mean, we saw a similar thing with, you know, um, a TJ Galliardi comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of those things where you kind of hope the player projects somewhere and then, you know, there's a flash and it doesn't really go to no, go anywhere. I mean, but the two seasons before the Sharks went to the cup final, Wingles had back-to-back 15-goal -back years. I mean, right there, it should have been like, hey, we have this depth guy that we're not going to have room for eventually. What do you want for him? And with Nieto, I mean, I've never, besides his foot speed, I was never really impressed with him from his first season in Teal. So, I mean, you lose a guy on waivers who was the first, um, got claimed by the first team. It sucks, obviously, but at the same time, I'm not really as upset to see him go. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, like, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a huge Nieto guy either. I just, it was just, just more of a situation of asset management, which right. I, I thought was kind of uh, poor. So let's, let's leave. We got, um, let's, let's get off poor Doug Wilson's back now and, uh, <laughs> Let's talk coaching staff. Um, Jerk, why don't you start with the with the coaching staff? What are your thoughts on uh, Peter DeBoer and, by extension, his staff uh, after this season? Um, you know, we've seen in years past, especially Peter DeBoer with the Panthers and with the Devils. You know, he has an awful trend of doing really well that his first year, and then the following years, he's just no better than anybody else, and. You could argue that we've seen the same thing with the Sharks, but I don't hate the job that Peter DeBoer did. You know, with with the exception of playing Michael Haley in times where you could argue that he shouldn't have been played, I thought he played the guys who needed to be played, and I really like that he's not afraid to scratch guys who aren't doing so well. I mean, no knock to Todd McClellan, but we've seen guys under his regime go through awful cold spells, mm -hmm. and he keeps them playing while... DeBoer says, look, if you're not going to help me out here, then I'm not going to help you out. And I really like that aspect of him. I I just, I really don't have any complaints about Peter DeBoer other than I felt there were times where a line would get a lot of chemistry, you know, especially the captain's line or, you know, Couture, Marlowe, and Bodker. And then on a whim, he would break them up for insert reason here, which kind of bothered me. And as for his staff, I mean, yes, the power play was atrocious this year, and Steve Spot is the one who works on the power play, but, you know, it's not one guy. I have to think that Peter DeBoer is in Steve Spot's ear, even just a little bit of on the power play. It's a, it's a group effort. It's not just one guy, and I think Steve Spot gets an unfair amount of criticism shoveled on him. And um, Johan Hedberg, goalie coach. I've liked what I've seen from him and Nabokov as well. I mean, we've seen how well Jones has played, and Aaron Dell was a virtual unknown a year and a half ago, and I, I think he's a solid backup, and I'm excited to see what he can do with more starts should he get them. Yeah, I I agree with a lot of those points that Jerk uh, made, and, and – at the the locker cleanout, that was one thing that was probably as hot as I saw uh, DeBoer get is is when they were talking when the reporters were firing the questions and the power pay, uh, excuse me the power play came up the coaching staffs by virtue of that Steve Spot DeBoer came out and just said you know what that's on all of us you know we all sit down as a unit just because he's the one tasked with kind of managing it you know. DeBoer jumped right on that grenade and said, ultimately, it falls to me. All the decisions right. are up to me. You know, the assistant coaches more or less do what I say, you know, is, is kind of reading between the lines there. And so kudos to him for, for kind of protecting his staff, right? You know, the buck does end with Peter DeBoer, and, and he reminded everyone of that in no uncertain terms. Uh, that said, the, the one critique that I have is – I would have liked to see the defense once again better utilizing Dylan DeMello and the pieces they've got, uh, getting familiar with each other. So if, if the strategy had to change, it wasn't all of a sudden somebody looking over and like, I've never skated backwards with you over there in my life. Um, that's a concern. Dylan DeMello uh, is an NHL player. Uh, I think he could have been helpful. Uh, where he would have slotted in, I, you know, we could argue about that and, and discuss it with, you know, 
Braun and, and Vlasic having uh, an up and down series. Obviously, you don't take out Mark Edward Vlasic, but you know maybe for Brendan Dillon getting a, just another uh, puck mover back there. You know, uh, just something where it's better. You know, utilizing the pieces that you've got. Uh, you know, we we didn't really see the line blender up and you know until late until really their hand was forced with the injuries. But you you've got to be able to switch strategies around. And I felt like DeBoer, he gets married to his defensive pairings for sure. Mm-hmm. Really with the forwards, he'll kind of marry a, a a winger and a center. And I don't disagree with that nearly as much because you can sh- uh, shuffle the other pieces. Most of the Sharks are centers anyway, so they can play anywhere. Um, but that was one thing that I would have liked to see, in addition to more starts for Aaron Dell. Uh, Aaron Dell. He's an NHL caliber backup for sure. Uh, there were times where the workload looked to be getting to Jones. And when you've got a, a, a backup that is dependable and capable like that, there's just no reason not, you know, or there's no reason to run your starting goaltender into the ground. Yeah, for me, I got kind of hot with DeBoer a little bit. I, I think my frustration with Peter DeBoer just comes from from stubbornness. Um, you know, like the, the power play obviously was a huge example. Look, everyone figured out Brent Burns. Everyone knew what was going to happen. Brent Burns was going to get the puck at the point. And everyone started blocking all of his shots. I mean, it's no it's no secret Brent Bur- why Brent Burns went cold at the end of the season. And there was just a refusal to adapt to that. Like everyone kind of had the Sharks power play kind of pegged. And and it's not just all, I'm not just going to blame Brent Burns specifically. Obviously, you know, Thornton kind of lost a step this year. And I think that hurt the power play. But some of these, you know, the th- but there was just situations where, you know, things were just clearly not working. And there was just no desire, it felt like, to deviate from it. And that for me was very frustrating to watch. Um, Arundel, yeah, Arundel is another, another guy where obviously he should have gotten more starts. Um, you know, uh, he's a good goalie and, and Martin Jones just gets got too many starts. And, you know, I don't think, you know, Martin Jones didn't have a great year, but it wasn't a terrible year. And I just think that if he had, you know, maybe a little less work, then, you know, maybe that would be better for Martin Jones. Because I think there was times where he did just look just discombobulated and tired. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of my beef with Peter DeBoer right now. I don't think, like, I mean, all this talk about firing Peter DeBoer is silly. Like, no one, he's not going to get fired. But, I, I mean, next season I would hope to see, you know, a little more flexibility when something's clearly not working instead of trying to jam the, the square peg in the round hole. One thing to remember, though, and I, and I think this is a good reminder for everyone, is just how little time NHL teams have to practice. Right. So if you, if you are going to make wholesale changes and you've had a system that's installed for, say, 18 months, that is difficult to really you know, throw out the entire power play and say, you know what, we're trying something completely different. So that's it's just a, just a point. You know, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're kind of taking different angles on the same idea of flexibility and versatility. Um, but at the same time, there's got to be uh, some lo- – a uh, little bit of give mm-hmm. that, you know, they're, they're not going to get five days of practice like the Barracuda. Uh, they're, they're not going to have time. Whatever is installed in the system organizationally, you know, pretty much at the start of the season, that's kind of where that ship's got to sail. Right. Um, and just like in the chat here, like I don't think in a different market, Peter DePore would be fired this year. He just, he's just coming off a, a cup final year. He's, he's, he wouldn't be fired in any market period. Uh, if I, I think in maybe another market, if the sharks just stumble out of the gate next year, uh, I think in some markets he might be on some pretty thin ice, maybe even in this one, but I'm not, I'm not sold on that, especially with the injuries in the playoffs. Uh, all right. Well, we've 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 cut open the head, and uh, we have brains everywhere. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's move down. Start opening things up in the chest. Let's go to the uh, let's go to the heart. 
Uh, let's talk about Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe, which this should be fun. I mean, uh, injured, the walking dead, basically, is, is what I'm going to call them now. Uh, you know, um, Marlowe had a broken thumb. Joe Thornton didn't even have a leg, apparently. Um, you know, it was just kind of like there. Um, you know, obviously, they're, they're, these guys are both pending UFAs. Uh, a lot of conversation on, you know, do you do you not sign them? Do you sign them? Blah. I don't know. Zach, where, where, where are you on uh, Patrick Marlowe and Joe Thornton? So there's there's no denying that they are the face of this franchise. They, they've been intertwined ever since they both entered the league in 1997 as pick number one and pick number two, and then were reunited by the hockey gods. You know, to, to call these players, uh, you know, intertwined is an understatement. And now both of them testing free agency waters potentially for the first time, even more so. Thornton's injury is scary at his age. He's He was yeah. never a, a, a blazing fast skater. He had lost a step, and now you're going to add major reconstructive knee surgery on a 38-year-old body that has seen a couple things. And I think that has to be concerning. For the Sharks specifically, I think that – and this, this sounds terribly insensitive. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> um, their team doctors are, you know, were the ones that did the surgery yesterday. They described it as successful. They said that he was going to be ready for the season. I find that hard to believe, but that's the word. If, if Thornton is going out on, on the open market and there's 30 other teams looking at him, uh, it's obviously no secret that he's had major knee surgery. Does that scare away some suitors? Does that drive his price maybe a little bit lower? Maybe it's a one-year show me. Uh, or maybe it's a, it's a limited two-year with, with uh, performance bonuses. Who knows? It, it, it opens up, I think, a whole new world contractually when you take into account his age, his contract status, where he's at. Joe Thornton's not going to go play in Las Vegas. No. You know, I, he's looking for kind of the feeling I get when, when talking to Joe Thornton, and he said it, he understands that this is a team that, that is going to have a chance next year. They had a chance this year. It didn't work out really due to, you know, injuries. A, a healthy Joe Thornton and a healthy Logan Couture completely changed the complexion of the playoffs. That said, it's going to be a big question mark on what his contract looks like. And with looking at the Sharks' salary cap, uh, you know, probably staying flat league-wide unless the NA, uh, NHLPA hits the escalator. It's going to be tough to, to fit all that in there. Yeah, oh, I agree. Jerk, what's what's your take on uh, Thornton and Marlowe? <sighs> you know what? I, I, a part of me kind of wants the team to move on from them just to, you know, like, you know, we've had conversation before, just pull off the Band-Aid and just, get the retool, reset, reconfigure, whatever you want to call it. Just get the wheels turning on it as soon as possible to eliminate some future uh, heartache. But, I mean, at the same time, th yes, they're both 38 years old, but they can – this year I feel they they were effective, especially Patrick Marlowe. And I don't think that the price tag of this year should be what um, holds people back from wanting them to come back because – there's nothing saying that Thornton and Marlowe won't be like, yeah, we like it here. You know, we want a good, we know we have a good team. We will do whatever it takes to stay. There's nowhere is it written that is said that they won't do that and you have to give them $7 million. I think Marlowe is still an asset. He still has incredible speed for his age and he still has one of the best wrist shots in the league. And I've noticed too in the last two or so years he started to use his body more which you could argue does wear him down physically but at the same time it, the physicality is something that i've wanted to see from marlo for a long time and so i think in that respect he's still an asset for us as for joe thornton like zach said you know you're having major reconstructive knee surgery at age 38 yeah that's you're looking at a minimum of six months 
because you know there's all kinds of recovery times you know a lot of rest comes into it but then you have to consider physical therapy you have to consider the possibility of a setback you know let's say joe thornton thinks he's ready you know puts on the skates does one push off and something happens with his knee and he's out for x amount of months even more i i I think this injury is going to cause a lot more long-term issues than we all anticipate. I will be surprised if he's ready to go on opening night. So by that respect, I agree with Zach. I think a, you know, a lesser AAV would be due for him just because of the uncertainty and maybe more than one year, but even then the dollars would seriously have to be low for anybody to consider more than one year. Yeah. And and with Marlowe, I think that that's a, a really good point. He's got, a lot, I think, left in the tank. And at clean out day, he said he thought he had five good years left in him. And I, I think Patrick Marlowe is still one of the fastest players in the NHL period, a, you know, age or no age. He's just – he's got wheels. He's And when Patrick Marlowe loses a step, then he's just a really fast player. You know, it, it's – I don't think Patrick Marlowe is going to go from, you know, one of the fastest players in the league to – uh, Joe Thornton's speed this summer. I, I just don't see it. And then on a team already starved for goals, I feel like Marlowe actually is a player that they really need to be focusing on. You know, I, both of those guys, to be honest, and, and I wrote about this uh, today at the Hockey Writers, I feel like both of those guys, a two-year deal uh, let at, at a at far less than what they're making at nearly seven million each, probably in the high fives to six range. I think that's fair. I think that's what the market value is going to be. If Michael Bodker gets you, uh, you know, four million dollars, I would have absolutely no problem at Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe at five point nine each. Oof. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like. Uh, that that was kind of the thing that I've been, you know, everyone, uh, there's been a lot of chat, obviously, about what these guys value is going to be uh, going on. And, you know, um, they're not making less than Mikel Bodker. There's just no way that these guys are going to come back for less money than Mikel Bodker is making, whether he's here or not. And that's, you know, that's a completely other, other topic. Initially, when on the after dark, when the Sharks went out, um, which you have to always remember is in the moment. Sometimes I don't always think clearly um, because you're you're talking in the moment. And so I know this might seem a little backsteppy a little bit, but with with the benefit of, you know, you, you go on to after dark and you talk in the, in the moment and you don't always have time to, to really reflect on things. Now, at the time I said, yeah, pull the Band-Aid off. You know, I want to see what Pavelski is without Joe Thornton before he gets another deal, which isn't, you know, which is, he has, what, two seasons left now. Um, there are three seasons left now. Uh, you know, and that's, that's still a concern of mine, obviously. And you, obviously you have to re-up Vlasic and everything else. The problem is this is a team that can't afford to step back because right. you, you have no draft picks. I mean, okay, you have draft picks this year. You have a first, a fifth, two sixths, and three sevenths, which means we'll get three Joe Pavelskis for sure. <laughs> but Hopefully a Dylan DeMello in there too. Which yes, is one of the- yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you have no draft picks this year. So it's not like, and then next year, you're still missing a second and a third in, in, a, in what should be a pretty decent draft class. Now, you can re-get picks, but here's the problem, right? Is you kind of have to bring them back. And even bringing them back, maybe you're in purgatory. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you kind of slide into this, you know, maybe we make it. Maybe we're a one, two, and done team. We don't, we don't know. But, I mean, that's... A possibility or you step back with no draft picks no picks to offer sheet anybody no decent free agents to really sign and bring in i mean i don't know what else you're supposed to do there's you know as much as as joe thornton and, and patrick marlowe may not be everyone's favorite players right now and especially with thornton with his his injury but is there anyone else like there's no one to replace them and without having the picks to start really turning things around. Cause I don't think you want to do a whole, you know, you didn't sign Brent Burns to an eight year deal at 8 million to completely tear it down to the bolts. Right. So that's not, you know, you can't just, you can't just trade everything, not nail down. And you know, that's, that would just be stupid because you still have, you know, um, do you really want to trade a Logan Couture at this point? No, 
you know, do you want to let Vlasic walk? No. Like, there's, you know, I mean, like, it, I know, I know there's been lots of talks of, you know, of just stripping it down because other teams have had success doing that. But for every team that's had success stripping it down, there's been two or three that have just been perennial losers. Right. And, and that's a great point. And, and everyone will point to the Edmonton Oilers with all their first round draft picks. They were one ping pong ball away from not having Connor McDavid. Yeah. So, so even pointing to the Oilers, that I, that was Powerball. I mean, that, that's what returned them to contention. I mean, Leon Dreisaitl is an excellent player, elite player. Yeah. He's not Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid opens up a ton of ice for the entire rest of that roster. And, and without him, their fringe playoff, maybe, with, with the other moves, maybe. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing, too, is, you know, since the Sharks have lost, you know, we've seen tear it down, start over, they can't win anything. We've seen all of those. And you know what? If the Sharks were a team like Edmonton, who had nothing, or a team like Buffalo or Toronto who had nothing, then I would say, yeah, go for it. But this team has good pieces. They have a legitimate starting goalie in his mid-20s. They have a franchise defenseman who just turned 32. They have Logan Couture, who in my eyes, again, unpopular opinion, is a number one center. They have Joe Pavelski, who is not the same player away from Joe Thornton, but is still a damn good player. With those pieces in play, you don't just tear it down. Right. right. It's, it's asinine, and it's an unnecessary step back. You, and I used the word earlier, you retool. You have to make the pieces around them better. You, it's, you can't place blame on the only guys who do anything to help your team out. Okay, I'm in the chat, and my nose is kind of freaking out. Look at yes, people that uh, people are tired of, of of seeing the Sharks not win, but you know what? If they tear it down to the bolts and with no guarantee, look at Doug Wilson has like going back to Doug Wilson. Something Doug Wilson has is a spotty as hell draft record, incredibly spotty. You want Doug Wilson to 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 be the guy who makes all the picks to bring the Sharks back to prominence? He's not going anywhere. Like drafting is, you know, I mean, the, the Sharks have done okay at the draft, but they've definitely, you know, there's definitely been some, you know, there's, there's been, I would say Doug Wilson has done all right, but he's not, I, I don't think drafting is his strongest suit. Well, you know, he's also had just only a, you know, not even a handful of top picks. And if sure. you look at, you know, NHL certainty, as soon as you get out of that top three, it gets murky. And to be able to find a, a Devin Setaguchi, who he flipped for Brent Burns, and, and at that point I thought that was trading at the high point uh, mm -hmm. on Setaguchi. Pavelski, uh, you know, is, is a better player with Joe Thornton, but I also think that Logan Couture is a better player with Joe Thornton ahead of him. Uh, right. I, I think Jerk... Might be right that he's a one center. I'd be happy to never find out uh, because, I, <laughs> because I think as a two center, Logan Couture. I always already think he's the best shark on the roster, and as a two as a two center with his skill set, he is positively deadly. So insulating him a little bit and allowing him to to roll out there against the other team's top line, I think long term uh, that's going to be a, a strength for the shark. Logan Couture was a seventh. Uh, seventh or ninth overall? Ninth. Ninth, thank you. You know, so so still a top ten. But with, with what folks are talking about, the 2019 draft looks good. The, the 2018 draft looks stupendous. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to tear down, if you're going to fully enact a Shanna plan, it's got to be right now. You would have to ditch Logan Couture. You would right. have to ditch Mark Edward Vlasic. Yep. Uh, Joe Pavelski. Yep. Uh, you would want Martin to Jones even. Mart yeah, Martin Jones. Uh, Vlasic's gone. Burns has to be. I mean, mm -hmm. to truly get in there, uh, you know, into those those top picks, where you're going to get a difference maker at you know at least a top five, and then now we have you know now the NHL has the lottery. 
you could yeah. finish dead last. Vegas and, is going to be in there, and you could be picking fourth. Yep. Then what? Yeah, I, there's I, just I, I don't know. Like you gotta you you. It's not the it's not time. Like you're you're stuck. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna tear it down, at least have some draft picks. Sharks don't have any for the next two years. Like they have they have picks, but not great picks. You might as well just well, ride that out. Yeah, they don't have their second or third next year either. Right. Exactly. So, like that's my point. Like, but it's, obviously, moving those players, you're going to replenish quite a bit there. Oh, for sure. Um, you, you could absolutely. I'd rather but, have my picks and then build off of that. Right. No. Exactly. And so, if, <laughs> if you already don't have your second and third, uh, that's that's dangerous. I mean, that that is a I mean, very dangerous game. Third, like the Sharks don't need their third. Let's be honest. <laughs> when have they ever done anything with a third? <laughs> Yeah, the track record in the third round is spotty. <laughs> and I okay. And here's another thing too. And I and I no doubt will ruffle some feathers with this, but you know, this is the three of us included. As Sharks fans, we have to remember that we've been very spoiled with very good seasons. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at what Mike Neva said in the chat. Uh, 26 seasons, and the Sharks have made the playoffs. I believe 19 or 20 times. Even with zero Stanley Cups, that is a damn good uh, ratio of making the playoffs. And there have been some really good Sharks teams that ultimately just fell short due to, you know, circumstances out of their control. And I, I, I hate to say the, you know, the it could be worse cliche, but that could not be further from the truth. I mean, you look at teams like Washington and St. Louis and Buffalo, teams who've been around for ever and have had some solid teams, have not been able to get it done. And in those situations, you kind of have to stay the course and just hope for the best. And even a team like the Los Angeles Kings, you know, their two cup teams were really good teams, but they didn't get those good teams until year 45. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a race to get the first Stanley Cup. You know, it's not like, okay, it's the NHL Centennial and you have zero cups, so you have to start – in the lowest league. Like it's not a race Back to the e with you. Yeah, exactly. Like it 26 seasons is a very minuscule amount of time compared to, you know, the league being around for a hundred and even like a team like the Montreal Canadians being around for even longer. Like yeah. you just have to remember that you're not going to win every year. And you just have to remember that we've been spoiled. And so we have to accept that, some things are not going to go our way. I think the thing that I said to you on After Dark, and, and and this never changed, is the one thing that I enjoy about being a Sharks fan more than anything else is that at this when the puck drops at the start of the year, I have hope. Because this is a team that could do something. I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a Jets fan where maybe we make the playoffs and maybe we win a round. Or, or Jets fan. <laughs> or you know or even worse right like i'm not a you know uh, you you talk about in the chat you know it's like you you talk about teams like yeah carolina has a cup does anyone really want to be a damn hurricanes fan right now they've been putrid before and after like i you know yeah okay great one season you win a cup but you know what i guarantee you after that little glow of winning a cup wears off and you stuck losing for 10 15 years the, the cup's not going to matter much anymore after that. So, so bringing this back around, and, and this will be a question for both you gentlemen. Okay. For the heart of the San Jose Sharks, Patrick Marlowe and Joe Thornton, do they have to be here for the Sharks to contend next year? Ooh. I don't think it would hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm just here's here's I so, mean so after this year you think they're contenders without Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe? Uh, no, uh, but I'm not sure they're contenders with either at this point because of okay. said leg injury and just because they're 38. Like the one problem is is that we're the only team in the NHL that is trying to run their offense through through two through two you know veteran like super veteran players. Everyone else is a lot younger. Okay, sure. Uh, you know what? I'm probably going to catch a lot of flack for this. 
<laughs> I I think Patrick. I thought Patrick Marlowe was a huge asset this year. Uh, scoring goals was a problem all year, and he yep. managed to put twenty seven in the back of the net like that. That's and you look at Joe Thornton. You know he had. I believe he had fifty points exactly, and I mean that's a good number, but that's not the Joe Thornton that we were used to. Obviously, uh, it's the first. This season is the first time since 0304 where someone else not named Joe Thornton has led the team in assists. And I don't think the Sharks would be any better without Joe Thornton. But at the same time, I don't think they would be any worse. I think the Sharks have a handful of guys who, when Thornton wasn't playing well or when he was injured, picked up the slack. I mean, obviously, Brent Burns creates a lot of offense from the blue line. Logan Couture consistently puts up 50 to 60 point years. Joe Pavelski is still good for 50 points. And there's a lot of emerging players from the Barracuda and other places that could pick up the slack in my eyes. And the emergence of Thomas Hurdle at center too, I think helps that argument. All right. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I like for me, I just think that, you know, when I, when I, when I just to, to wrap up on these two, like I just, I'm not sure if, bringing them back isn't just spinning our tires because I, I know we're all talking about the injuries and obviously the injuries in the playoffs were significant, but everyone was healthy when this team gave, coughed up a nine point division lead. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's still skepticism with me for that. Um, as far as, you know, can, can with the veteran players, can we, you know, can we make it through an 82 game season, let alone, you know, push through the playoffs again? Um, also, keep Patrick Marlowe in a contract year, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Let's move <laughs> on to the lungs. Um, the forward group. Obviously, um, you know, the, the lungs look a little undeveloped here, guys. They didn't get much from them. Um, is there is there enough lung here to, to be successful? Or was it just a bad, just weird circumstance where everyone kind of went cold? And I think, you know, here, I think in this situation, I think injury does play a factor. Uh, you know, Yunus Donskoy separated shoulder 18 times or something during the, the regular season. <laughs> um, that doesn't help. Twice. <laughs> right. Twice during the regular season. Um, also, yeah, wait, I'll, I'll, I can save this for later. All right. Um, <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, uh, Jerk, what do, you, what do you guys think of the, uh, the, the forward core? Uh, minus Thornton and Marlowe, obviously. I mean... You know, I, I said it earlier, and I said it on the most recent episode of The Pucknologist, too. You know, you have your big guys who are not Thornton and Marlowe. Like I said, Joe Pavelski, Logan Couture, Brent Burns. And obviously, they're going to put up decent seasons every year. That's a given. But you also have a lot of solid pieces, you know, who saw limited time in the NHL this year or who saw no time at all. I mean... Marcus Sorensen, we've gone on and on about. He His speed is a huge asset. I think if he takes the right steps, he can contribute in some capacity. Um, same thing with Kevin LeBanc. I mean, he's only two years removed from leading the whole OHL in goals. That's not something that happens by accident. And, you know, Timo Meyer, obviously a highly touted um, pick from his draft, you know, a good blend of offense and physicality and skating and, I, I think with him, he's probably going to need a little more work, but that's not to say that he can't be an elite level player. And then, you know, you look at a guy like Danny O'Regan, who had, I believe, 57 points in the AHL last year, or this year. Granted, it's 58. the eight, 58. It's the AHL, so obviously not the NHL, that's a given. But if he was able to, to put up, you know, two thirds of that or half of that at, at the NHL level, I think. That would consider him to be a solid player, and there's nothing saying that he can't get better. I mean, he's – help me out here, Zach. How old is he, 21, 22? Uh, I think he's just turned 22 if I'm doing my math right. He's a 94. Exactly, which he's still very young, and at 22, there's still a lot of room to grow. So I I don't think that – you know, with no Thor and no Marlow, this team is just dead. I think their forward core needs some work. There are some aspects of it that are very young and very inexperienced, but 
That's why this time is so crucial. This is the time to give those guys a chance and see if they have what it takes to make this team. Cheryl helping us out in the chat. O'Regan's 23. There's a reason I write and not, don't do math. Right. And, you know, and Gen X makes a good point. I mean, obviously junior hockey and even the HL is, is riddled with guys who own, you know, and then don't translate. Obviously no one's expecting Daniel Regan to translate point to point to the, to the NHL, but there's definitely something there. Um, you know, I think this is kind of where the Sharks, I think, paid a little bit for, you know, again, they, they, they went on their, their big run and, and they paid for it. Um, you know, Joel Ward still being around hurts at this point. Um, you know, it was he was good, but I mean, he definitely, I thought Joel Ward definitely lost a step this year. And I think that that you know that's that's problematic. Um, Bodker, we already went over. You know, Bodker definitely didn't pan out. Um, Donskoy being, you know, it's, can't do much in hockey with a separated shoulder. And coming back, and you know, uh, even coming back, if that shoulder is not completely healed, you're going to be half the player you are. We've seen what Jonas Donskoy can be, but with one arm, I mean, I don't think anyone's a particularly great player. Uh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, uh, I thought Logan Couture was fine, um, even despite, you know, um, Logan Couture obviously missed some time, uh, Thomas Hurdle missed some time, Hurdle obviously injuries are a concern at this point, and that's, that's frustrating for sure, um, but I still like what I saw from Hurdle this year, I think that, uh, you know, now people are going to be like, oh, where are all the points? But, you know, to me, he's a guy that does everything. He, he did everything but score. If, and if he can start, you know, finding a way to score from center, then he's going to be set. Like, I know that a lot of people really like him up with the Joes, but long term, that's not going to be an option. And then what do you want to do? You want to pay him for a good year with Joe Thornton and then pay him stupid money and then lose Joe Thornton and then find out that Thomas Hurdle can't do anything without him like i don't want that i'd rather i would rather slog through this center ice thing um you know and then other than that i mean you know kevin lebank came up uh he was really good for a while uh but but towards the end of the season i thought timo was good uh, especially in the playoffs but i mean he definitely played in the nhl probably much longer than he should have early on um, but, you know, again, Sorensen, I liked what I saw from Sorensen, and we'll see. I mean, uh, as far as that goes, you know, Pavelski's still Joe Pavelski. Um, you know, the, the, the tools are there. It's a, just a combination of players that don't fit or too many of the same type of player. Zach, what do you think? So just running through this, obviously... Logan Couture and Joe Pavelski are your top flight uh, stars on on the forward group down, you know, in the lungs as as we're calling it. Yes, I think Tomas Hurdle. I'm I'm still not sold uh, on him as a center. I feel like he's more dangerous as a wing, but that that argument um, it, it might be moot. They might just have to have him at center just because of body count. And, right. and th that can solve that. Uh, it was interesting at, at the media day, uh, DeBoer gave the comparison, and I don't think it's a fair one, is uh, with Jonas Donskoy. And, and he said, you know, is Sorensen a Donskoy, where we, we, we liked what we saw last year and takes a step back. I mean, mm -hmm. Donskoy had two separated shoulders yeah. this season. That to me, that might be the only forward that I give a pass to. Mm -hmm. You know, j just a do-over, two separated shoulders. Um, that's that's huge. We saw Joe Thornton get out there and, and at least be effective on half a leg. He already only had one leg. Then he broke, you know, half of that one. So, <laughs> you know, without a shoulder, that's that's brutal. And so for me. I think Donskoy gets a pass. Carlson, super hard worker. I, I don't know about his offensive ceiling being much higher, but is he a 20 to 30 point guy that gives you an honest effort, you know, game in and game out and is, and is a bit of a Swiss army knife? Sure. Chris Tierney, I'm not a huge fan of, and, and that was a player 
DeBoer called out, he's flat out said, Chris Tierney's not a young player anymore. He needs to take a step forward. Right. You know, and, and I agree with that assessment. Chris Tierney, you know, yes, he's only 22. Okay, great. He's also been in the NHL for two full time, you know, two full years. It, it's, is he turning into a Tommy Wingles, Matt Nieto? I mean, that that's a, that's a legitimate question at this point. He's he's got the smarts and the speed, but if he doesn't have that skill to be anything more than a three four, mm-hmm. you know, centerman, the Sharks. I mean, that's that's easily replaceable. That's not an asset that you need to protect in an expansion draft, or yep. you know, waste a, a a ton of money on or go to the wall to protect in trade talks. Uh, my stance on Joel Ward is well established. Uh, the Sharks are straddled with that contract at, you know, for another season at $3.275 million. If by some miracle the hockey gods descended from on high and mm-hmm. came to San Jose and evaporated that contract, I think that's huge. I, I, I just – I saw Joel Ward as a player that was um, not, not, real, not real engaged. Uh, he was cheating a lot. Uh, I, I just I didn't like any part of his game whatsoever this season. Bodker, that's 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 a whole show on its own. You know, at four million dollars and you know what, what was it 20, 26 points, ten goals, sixteen assists, twice when he was a healthy scratch to try to send a message. That that's just not going to cut it. You know, I, the, the flip side of that is I, I feel like at least with Bodker, he has some ability on the penalty kill. He's got speed. I, I like what he brings for a, a relatively similar dollar amount to, to Joel Ward. I, I feel like Joel Ward has to be – everything has to be explored with him. He has a modified no-trade clause. He can uh, – according to Cap Friendly, he has a, a 16 no-trade list. The other 25 teams with, with Vegas now a destination need to get a phone call. Yep. Doug Wilson is infamous for calling everybody and talking to everybody. Joel Ward's name has to come up, as well as probably Bodker. You know, he at least has to test the water on, on what's going on with, with Bodker. Hansen at $2 million, uh, you know, I'll take that. That, that. that is a depth player. That is somebody in your bottom nine that, that's versatile. Uh, the only UFA uh, among the the forward groups besides Thornton and Patrick Marlowe is Michael Haley. I I know this is there's been more ink spilled on Haley than any fourth liner in the history of the San Jose Sharks. <laughs> but I feel like Michael Haley, it's you know six hundred twenty five thousand. He did his job damn well. And if he came back and was you know if, if Peter DeBoer feels like he needs to have a middleweight in that lineup, at least Haley can play hockey. Uh, yep. You know, for nine minutes a night, and not completely doom you defensively. At six hundred twenty-five thousand to, to to be a thirteenth forward, fine. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you know, like, Haley, I, I, if he comes back, he comes back. If he doesn't, they'll find someone else to plug in that spot. It's not. It's not the end of the world. It's. I, think, I agree. It's, I think Michael Haley has has actually a, a tougher skill set to replace. So you need a middleweight, somebody that can drop the glove, somebody that can send a message. He's got to at least be, you know, a, a plus skater. And I think Michael Haley skates well. And he's got to be defensively responsible and be willing to set, accept league minimum while still being defensively responsible. That that that's a lot of that's a lot of check boxes to find, lo- you know, loafing around at league minimum. Matt, you know, uh, Timo replaces, except for Timo doesn't fight. He, yeah, he's got some sandpaper, but he's not a middleweight. Not even close. Yeah. Timo really doesn't. I mean, he can fight. He has fought before, but he's not a guy who's regularly going to drop the gloves. And he he's fought not in the queue. Really want to drop the gloves. He fought in the queue. Right. Yeah. I, I Something I, I want to. Something Go I ahead. want to point out too is, you know, Chris Edwards saying that De Simone is 22 and we're excited about him, but we're not excited about Chris Tierney. I believe he's talking about Chris Tierney, who's also a 22 year old center. The key difference here is 
D. Simone is a defenseman who's relatively new to the organization. With Chris Tierney, we kind of know what we have. And I thought from the start that Ryan Carpenter would take over Chris Tierney's spot in the lineup. And to this day, I still th- or I still think either a Ryan Carpenter or Danny O'Regan could easily step into Chris Tierney's spot with no drop off whatsoever. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, and I, but I, I will, I will concede the point that I was actually pretty impressed during the playoffs with Tyranny when he actually had decent line mates too. Oh, agreed, and so was I. You know, he, I believe, half of his goals this year were in the month of March and April in the regular season. Yeah. So that's enough to be impressed with. I just, I would like more consistency. Like, right, if he is, and you know, that goes back to DeBoer. I mean, if he's going to play well with good line mates, put him with good line mates, but. <laughs> Well, what what okay. good line mates do you surround him with when you've got Joel Ward, Mikel well, Bodger, Yannick Hansen? I mean, that's really what's fleshing out your your middle six. Yeah, well, no, probably no, bottom six. Bottom six at this point. Yeah, it's, it's there's a lot of questions for sure. And regarding Chris Tierney, he has a body of work of over 200 NHL games in the regular season and mm-hmm. 30 in the postseason. Yeah. I, I mean. He's a decent player. I'm, I'm not saying that you know he should be playing in the Southern you know uh, professional hockey league with the Knoxville Ice Bears. That's not what I'm saying. Right. You know. He, yeah. He's yeah, he's a bona fide NHL. Player. It's just is there enough room for him in this roster with all these other question marks laying around and young players that are knocking on the door? I I feel like he's expendable. I feel that he has a, a replaceable skill set, but he's going to have no problem uh, finding another job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's move on to the defense. Um, we're on the torso now. Uh, obviously, you know, Burns got cold in the end. And I don't know if it's so much that he got cold or, like I said earlier, everyone kind of just wisened up to the, the plan and countered it properly. Uh, you know, obviously, Vlasic Braun had an up and down year. Vlasic, especially, too. I was surprised when. Classic said that he was healthy and he's heading to the world championships to be completely honest. Um, Zach, I, I guess start us off on the defense. So I, I, I do subscribe to the, the theory that Burns just really went ice cold. Uh, there's been a book on Brent Burns. There's been a book for the last two and a half, three years on what you have to do uh, to try to slow him down and teams just couldn't. So much of this game is confidence, and I, I, to me, he was a player that was just gripping his stick and it was turning to sawdust because so much of the offense did come through him, uh, and, and that's that's a discussion, and and, and we're having it, yeah. and, and that <laughs> comes to you know deployment, that comes to strategy, that comes to the power play, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's I think that's what happens when you have a singular focal point in your offense. And it happens to also be the focal point of your your defensive strategy in the offensive zone. It's 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 just too easy to for me to to jump on this and say, well, Burns should have you know adjusted to this and that. I, I to me it looked like a player that had just lost his mojo, and it you know in media day he he frankly sounded despondent. I, I don't know if anyone saw you know any of the video that came out of there. I I just had my iPhone, but I, he just had the look of a guy that was tired of answering the same questions the same ways, and there were just so many long pauses and I don't knows and ums. You know, it, flip side of that is it's easy to give an interview and everything everything's going right. Yeah, you know, Burns is about to be the highest paid San Jose Sharks player in its history. You're going to have to get used to reporters putting a microphone in your face when it's not going good and saying, what's going on out there? That's That comes with the territory. You sign that deal, it's more than just a check. There's a lot more that comes with that. Huh. Yeah. Something something to jump on what you were talking about too, Zach. I, it's, it's a very, you know, very small, very stupid thing, but it's still something that stands out is, you know, when we've seen one of the members of the team who wears a letter on their jersey out of the lineup it's been marlo or it's been vlasic who usually picks up those reins but towards the end of the regular season and in the playoffs we saw brent burns with a letter on his jersey when joe thornton was out so you know 
my, myself personally, I've never been, I've never subscribed to the idea that Brent Burns should wear a letter as dumb of a concept I think it is. They're very clearly, and like you said, with the contract, they're clearly giving him uh, some more responsibility and some more, I guess, leadership, if you will. And so to what you said, Zach, you know, if whether you're on a 10 game win streak or a 10 game losing streak, you have to be able to go in front of the cameras and say, this is what we're doing wrong. This is how we need to fix it. This is what we're doing right. You know, this is what's going on. You can't just say, you know, I don't know. We'll figure it out, you know, or, um, uh, you got to have answers. Yeah. And, and I think Vlasic, you know, to his credit, uh, he, he does have that, and, and you do see it. And he'll, he'll get out there, and, and that's the guy that's staring down the other team's top lines. Yep. Uh, you know, I I went back and, and forth uh, on this with Chris Edwards on, on Twitter. Realistically, the pairing of Vlasic and Braun, their possession numbers, took a step back this season. Um, and there's a, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, he was arguing more for – five-on-five five goal differential, which I kind of equate to fancy stat version of plus-minus. Uh, when you have Vlasic and Braun able to provide the defense that they did last year and be positive possession players in Corsi, meaning you're getting more shot attempts when they're on the ice than you are giving up, that's key. And I, I think that's an, under, uh, an under-realized angle of this season. You had both Vlasic and Braun struggling – giving up more shots and, and not helping create as much. And whatever went into that, whether it's defensive play, you know, fell off, which I think we saw a bit of, uh, you know, the forwards not helping them out as much. You know, there's just, there's so much that goes into that. It's a, but defense is a five-man unit. And that's the point where I think that you look at Vlasic and Braun. Those two get the, the defensive zone starts. They do all the heavy lifting. They carry a lot of water for the San Jose Sharks. And those are the guys that you need to, you know, flip series and flip games and flip winning and losing streaks around. Um, I, you know, they're both uh, still obviously key players to the San Jose Sharks. Braun's an interesting one. You know, he's under contract for $3.8 million for the next three years. Uh, do the Sharks do some estate planning? Do they expose Braun because they feel that his skill set is replaceable in the market where Vlasic is the obvious linchpin, right? I mean, the Sharks don't think that. Everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just a statement of fact. Uh, so if Braun is exposed because he's a very good NHL defender and at $3.8 million coming off the books and maybe they have higher hopes for DeMello, I feel Joachim Ryan – uh, is ready for a long look. Tim Heed, if you can get him under contract, which we'll get to, but I, I kind of doubt. Um, you know, the Sharks have some some defensive ability coming up through the pipeline where perhaps losing Justin Braun and his salary makes a difference. And if you protect Braun, um, then that obviously exposes Brendan Dillon and, and uh, David Schlemko. But I feel like DeMello could, could fill in uh, very nicely as the right-handed shot on either of those two. So it'll be interesting. Uh, Wilson uh, at the media day said that he already knows what he's doing as far as a, a 7-3 or or an 8 skater protection. Uh, he wouldn't share it uh, when pressed. He, he kind of uh, jokingly gave up that, yes, Martin Jones will be protected. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, so Aaron De yeah, so he did give uh, the media that so everyone can rest assured that Martin Jones – Breaking news: um, Will be protected in the upcoming expansion draft. So Aaron <laughs> Dell's the exposed goalie, uh, but you know, other than that, you know, there's some decisions to make, and, and they have long-term ramifications, right? You know, especially with the the cap being flat. So what they do on defense is going to be interesting. I thought Schlemko was was a good signing. You know, he he had his ups and downs. Uh, but I thought overall it, it was a positive upgrade over Roman Polak. Uh, yeah. Brent, Brendan Dillon's a, a very serviceable 5'6". that adds uh, toughness, a bit of fighting, um, just a good bit of sandpaper back there on, on a blue line that doesn't have much of it outside of him. So, uh, you know, he's a, he's a player with a role to play. He's still young. He's 26. You know, 3.2 might be a bit high for him. Uh, 
but I guess at some point you have cost certainty in youth and that does cost money in today's NHL. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, the defense, obviously it starts with Vlasic and, and, and trickles its way down. And I thought Vlasic had an off year, but I don't expect that to continue. I still think that Vlasic is still one of the best defensemen right. in this league period. It's not even close. Um, you know, Brent Burns, obviously going cold was an issue, but again, I think that, um, you know, Brent Burns will recover and everything's going to be okay. Uh, you know, you don't want him to, you don't want him to kind of, you know, be crushed under the weight of that contract, hopefully. But I think, you know, it's Brent Burns. He's going to be fine. Stop talking about moving into forward or I'm going to come through a monitor and hit you in the throat. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, the bottom guys, I think, you know, DeMello, uh, Dylan, Schlemko, I mean, these are all, these are all serviceable guys. Um, I don't really have any ill will towards any of them. Um, I thought Paul Merton kind of lost this step. And I know that some people are still very much on the, you know, that's the Burns whisper and you kind of need him for that reason. I, I'm not as sold on that. I, I still think you could find, a younger upgrade there and maybe Burns could be okay. But, you know, that's obviously up for debate. Um, I just think it's hard to find that good of a defender. Um, right. You know, he, is he overpriced at 4.85 uh, for the next two seasons? Sure. But to find that smart of a defender that's willing to deal with his partner more times than not being there for him, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, see, I, I do think he's a bit of, of the Wookiee whisperer. Um, <laughs> you know, I I see that role. I uh, at the cost, I think, is uh, excessive. But I I feel like Paul Martin is is still a contributor. I feel like he's a, he's a solid player uh, that's plugged into his role, and he just goes about doing his job. So here's my question, though, because could could you see like because obviously Brent Burns is going to be here for a while eight years um could you see someone like Joachim ryan fitting in that paul martin role going at, at some point not not next year but going forward Ooh. i could and because you look at the barracuda all year it's been the Joachim ryan and tim heed show mm -hmm. and tim and tim heed has i mean no by no stretch is tim heed brent burns he doesn't have nearly enough facial hair or tattoos. That's true. That's right. But, uh, you know, a lot of times Tim Heed, you know, he'll, especially on the power play, he'll slide off from the point kind of down the boards and, you know, he'll take a shot. And we've seen him many times on two on ones have no issue about just going all in and taking the shot or taking the pass. And you know what? Yoakam Ryan is always right there to back him up and get back. I, I'm a big fan of Yoakam Ryan's skating. I think he's really good with his stick as well. I could absolutely see him step into Paul Martin's role. And honestly, you know, the way the cards fall, you know, if it's DeMello or if it's Braun or Schlemko or whomever that's taken, I would have no issue with Joachim Ryan being the six, seven defenseman either. Yeah. I, I completely <laughs> concur with uh, Dr. Jerk there. Um, it, it, it's Joachim Ryan just checks a lot of boxes. If he was six foot three, we'd be hearing a heck of a lot more of him. And Doug Wilson would be getting a heck of a lot more phone calls. Uh, that, you know, that said, he is a very complete two-way defender, and he's very good at the AHL level. Uh, defensemen, especially, you don't know what you got until they get some NHL seasoning, and you've right any of them. Um, even you look at Brent Burns. I mean, he he flip flopped once he turned pro between forward and defense. What two two three times? Two or three times? You know, just trying to figure out what to do with this skill set. You've got to be able to uh, grow with the player. Very few NHL defenders are Mark Edward Vlasic playing as an 18-year-old and playing well. That is the rare exception and, and certainly not the rule. So uh, I feel like the Sharks have brought Dylan DeMello along properly. They've brought him in. They've had him practice. They've got him in spot duty this year. He got leaned on a little bit more. I think very easily Dylan DeMello could step in on for whoever is lost on the Sharks roster. You might have to shuffle your pairings. Yeah. And I, I know that that's scary to the coaching staff. Um, but you might have your hand forced. 
Uh, and then Joachim Ryan coming up and starting that Dylan DeMello apprenticeship, I would be completely comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would, that's, I think something that that's, that's what I would like to see. Maybe I, you know, maybe not next season, but before this is all said and done, that's, that's kind of where I've kind of got Joachim Ryan penciled into my lineup uh, going forward is, is beside Brent Burns. Um, let's, you know, since we're, since we're on um, Joachim Ryan and, and stuff, let's, let's get to the young players. So let's talk about the, the Kevin LeBanks, the Daniel Regans, the, the, the Timo Myers. Um, <laughs> Zach, why don't you start us off here with the with the with the young players? What are your, what are your thoughts on what we've seen uh, this year, and even even in the pipeline, and, and what we've seen in the NHL? I like them. That, that's all I got. Okay. <laughs> no, um, I, I think Kevin LeBanc is going to be. He's got that ability to be a, a second line uh, scoring winger. Uh, he's definitely NHL ready. Hearing about the Donskoy injury, it is completely puzzling to me why he wasn't uh, in that discussion on a team that's already searching for goals. Uh, I thought LeBanc's uh, off-puck play really took some big strides, and he, he's cooling off a little bit with the Barracuda. Um, some of that killer instinct uh, isn't quite showing yet in, here in the playoffs quite yet, but I think he'll get going. But his off-puck play is so much better than what we were seeing in October, November, December. Um, that and that's that's going to be uh, a, a differentiator there. I think Daniel Regan's ready uh, for a look at, the, at that fourth line. He's still uh, waiver eligible, so he's a player that you there's going to get a really long look at camp. I just, I, it's it's time his defensive awareness, his all around play. It's not just the points. The points are great. But the way Daniel Regan plays the game, sees the game, and reads the game, uh, he's ready for an extended look. Ryan Carpenter is a UFA, and it'll be interesting to see what he does. He's a player again, and and this, I'm sorry for those of you that are regulars of the show. You hear me say it all the time. There's right. about there's about to be 25 new jobs in the NHL. Ryan Carpenter is one of the best two way players in the AHL today. It's really hard to imagine him not contending heavily for a regular NHL job next year. Um, he's, you know, I think he's a player that could leave uh, for more opportunity. Same with Tim Heat. I think Tim Heat is going to – some team that needs a puck-moving, right-handed, booming-shot defenseman is just going to go to Tim Heat and say, we'll give you a two-year, $2.2 million one-way deal. And if he's their seventh defenseman, fine. If he – you know, can swim with the the yeah, at the NHL level. They'll obviously play him. Too many teams need that skill set of a smooth skating, um, you know, power play quarterback, right handed shot. That just checks way too many boxes. Every team except for the NHL Jets. The Jets okay, have more um, right handed defenders than anyone should rightfully have. For sure. Uh, just Cheryl in the chat. Just interesting that the CUDA extended McCarthy and not and not Carpenter. The the thing is with that is that um, the Barracuda obviously they can uh, they can sign people to to just AHL only deals, which John McCarthy is most definitely on. He's not on a two way deal. He can't be called up to the Sharks without a contract with the Sharks. Whereas Ryan Carpenter is under contract to the San Jose Sharks, which is why um, the Bar you don't want the Barracuda to sign him because. Then he's just under AHL contract, right? And, and and Ryan Carpenter not being re-signed. Remember, that's a two-way street. It takes his signature on, on that contract. He might look yeah. at the roster and see a Timo Meyer, a Danny O'Regan, uh, a Kevin LeBanc, and Michael, you know, Mikael Bodker, Joel Ward being stuck with the Sharks, and look around and say. You know, even at Chris Tierney, Chris Tierney is in a spot that Ryan Carpenter, I think, could contribute on and, and possibly better. And so if I'm Ryan Carpenter, I'm looking around and saying, no, thanks. Oh, wait. Right. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> uh, th there's no reason for him to to be one more log on the log jam. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, look, at these guys are getting to age. Troy Grosnick, uh, you know, Tim Heed. Uh, Ryan Carpenter. These guys are all getting to the age now where their 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 window to make the NHL is sliding shut, 
Right. And they're going to have to, they're, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be looking for opportunities. Now, I think Tim He, based on his body of work in the AHL, will sign, probably get a one way deal from a team that wants to use him next year in their regular six. Right. That's going to look a hell of a lot more appealing than being the Sharks' seventh D man. Exactly. You know, um, you know, Ryan Carpenter, same thing. Ryan Carpenter came up. I was impressed with the games Ryan Carpenter played this year. There's probably a team that, you know, might not be as deep and could use, you know, a fourth line center. Ryan Carpenter can fill that role. And if he has that chance to play in the NHL, even if it's not with the Sharks, I mean, he's going to do it because it's getting to the point now where, again, the window sliding shut, man. You get past 26, 27, 28, and you are, you cross that line from, you know, prospect to journeyman very quickly. Um, and Troy Grosnick, same thing. Troy Grosnick is not going to get, uh, you know, a shot in San Jose. Right. He, he had it. He blew it last year, in my opinion. You know, he, he was on a one week deal this year. I think the Sharks had him penciled in as the backup to, uh, Martin Jones and you know Aaron Dell stole his job and stole his opportunity and that's just kind of what happened. So Troy Grosnick again, yeah, uh, you know winning Calder Cups is nice, but playing in the NHL is better. Yeah, you know Carpenter, you, you know he got called up for those eleven games. He had two goals to assist, uh, and, and he looked uh, completely at home at, at the NHL level. And so you know he's he's got a cup of coffee. Um, he he's a known quantity at the AHL level, and plenty of teams have you know the professional scouts out there. Um, I agree with you 100 percent on Tim Heed. Uh, when scouts have come through for Barracuda games, and I've been lucky enough to chat with them, Tim Heed's name has come up every single time, every single time. Um, every scout wants to just know how's he look, how's his season been, have you been impressed? You know, they're they're not listening to me; they're just trying to to get as much information. Uh, you know, as possible on this player, and, and but that's who you can tell th that they're interested in. And I agree 100% on on, on Troy Grosnick, and he's going to parlay this into uh, contending for a backup spot somewhere else. Yep. Um, other than that, I mean, other kids look at, um, you know, uh, Kevin LeBanc, pretty happy with. I thought that, uh, yeah, he kind of cooled off at the end of the year, but... Um, Look, this is a guy who I didn't even have penciled in TB to sniff the Sharks this year. Um, so, you know, uh, Kevin LeBanc, I, and, you know, for people that have listened to this show or previous shows, incarnations of this show, something I said a lot is that this, you know, there's nothing negative about Kevin LeBanc this year. Everything's, you know, the fact that he was even there is is positive. Everything's positive with Kevin LeBanc right now. Um, obviously, we're going to want to see him take some steps next year, but he was still, you know, but he was still good. Like he was still way ahead of schedule, in my opinion. And, you know, so that's good. Uh, Timo Meyer uh, is a guy who else also I was up and down on all year. Um, but this year in the play, like this last playoff run, I thought he was really, I thought he was really good. And I thought that, you know, in a, in a time where, you know, a lot of people were talking about him replacing Michael Haley in the playoffs was a perfect time because you don't really drop the gloves in the playoffs. So you just have a sandpaper guy that kind of runs all over the place and gets people annoyed. And and I thought he, he was great. Like, I was super excited about Timo Meyer's game. Uh, it was one of the few bright spots of the series for me. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm pretty... I'm pretty content with what the kids did. Kevin, Le uh, sorry, Daniel Regan had a couple of cups of coffee. I think Daniel Regan could easily step in and, and no drop off between him and Tierney um, and, and off you go. So uh, it's positive. And then the Barracuda, obviously there's, there's guys in the Barracuda that are coming along the Yoakum Ryans, the, the Rourke Charches. Uh, you know, these guys are going to be NHLers at some point. It doesn't matter that it's not right now. Right. Marcus Sorensen also, you know, we saw late in the season. Um, he's going to be an interesting player to watch. He's got blazing speed. He might be the fastest player in the, in the entire uh, San Jose organization. I mean, mm -hmm. he's that fast. Peter DeBoer leading heavily on him for, you know, in the playoffs. I think that shows the trust that he had in him. He's an RFA. That's going to be an interesting bit to watch because as he moved up the lineup, uh, and in fact, he was on the second line in the last game, um, you know, with, with Bodker kind of sliding back and, and Ward and all those right. guys. Um, 
you know, is he a player that, uh, to bring up, uh, we are all Kevin's favorite pra- player, uh, you know, Victor Arvidsson type. That's just mm-hmm. a late bloomer and got passed over and then, you know, takes a year to figure it out and next year comes out blazing. Marcus Sorensen will shoot the puck from anywhere. He's a, he's, he's a gunslinger. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the Sharks, um, what the Sharks do with him. Who do you think Sorensen could replace in the lineup to be regular? Uh, is a question in the chat. I don't know if it's replace. I, I think that he's, you know, probably going to be in a bottom six role, uh, adding speed. He's a he's a very dangerous uh, penalty killer. He, he's he's effective there. Um, he's. He, he has a tendency to float a little bit and that comes back to his, you know, European training. I mm-hmm. think that, you know, as a summer here and working out and, you know, it's, it, he, he's not a, a, a finished product, uh, but there's enough pieces there where I think that he could be in that mix, duking it out for jobs. Um, and, it, and it does come down to, you know, roster space. Yeah. You know, if, if you're keeping, you know, if Thornton and Marlowe are back and you can't move Bodker or Ward, um, you know, Haley, you know, as a UFA, do you bring him back? Um, there's there's a lot of moving pieces, and not the least of which is the expansion draft, which is just going to evaporate somebody from your lineup. Right. Uh, M. Hackle, just before I hand this over to Jerk, it just said, I, th- I thought Timo shot from everywhere. Timo did shoot from everywhere. The problem is, is not all the shots he took were very good. Right. <laughs> um, this is a criticism that came from both Peter DeBoer and Roy Sommer over the course of the season is that, yeah, you, you like a guy that shoots from everywhere, obviously, but the problem is, is his shot selection was still very junior hockey. Right. And that was our critique of him way back, even with the Barracuda, right. you know, when he came back there. So it's almost like we know what we're talking about once in a while. Maybe. Jerk, what, what's your thoughts on the kids? Uh, you know, the kids that, <clears throat> excuse me, the kids that did come into the lineup this year, I was very impressed. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me about Kevin LeBanc, yes, he's got a good shot. Yes, his speed is good. But I felt, and I said it many times on the many different platforms that, you know, Pucknology, Teal Town USA offers, you know, even if he's not putting up points, he's a very smart player. He does a lot of right, all the right things, you know, with and without the puck. I was a big fan of his game and I hope he takes the steps, um, you know, takes a step forward. Uh, Zach mentions um, Marcus Sorensen, you know, his speed, obviously an asset. We saw him uh, by the end of things in game six, higher in the lineup than a Bodker and a Hansen. Um, and again, you know, a very smart player takes a lot of high percentage shots and he's somebody who you can definitely be excited for. I thought Timo Meyer's regular season was eh at best, but as soon as the playoffs started, he was my favorite player to watch, and he was part of that really good fourth line in the playoffs with him, Sorensen, and Tierney, and I was upset that it got broken up, but then, you know, they had him on Hurdle's wing, and I was just as much a fan of that as well. So I think um, LeBanc, Sorensen, and Meyer are going to be your three guys to kind of look forward to. Um at least for the near future, you know, I would say as early as next year. And then kind of long-term, you know, Rourke Chartier, I think at best is maybe a third line center, but there's nothing saying he couldn't jump up into the lineup if he can, you know, find some of the scoring that he had that one year with Kelowna. Um, I'm a big fan of Adam Haluka. You know, I think he's a very physical, but a very smart player as well. I would like to see him or, um, get a better, little better on the offensive side of things. But I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of good pieces that the Sharks currently have in their system. And it's just a matter of time to, before we can see if they, if they become great pieces or if they'll just stay good pieces. And obviously Danny Regan, you know, I said it before, put up a lot of points in the AHL, but again, very smart player, defensively responsible, sees the ice yep. better than anybody on the Barracuda, I would say. And it, he's one of those guys where you hope that, his level of play translates to the NHL level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before before we get to the the expansion draft and everything else, I, I thought we should probably quickly just talk on goaltending quick. Um, what do you guys, any thoughts on, on the goaltending this year? I know it shouldn't take very long. 
Um, what did you think of Jones this year, I guess, is the question that I have. Yeah, it won't take too long because we only saw Aaron Dale for a couple games, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you think, Jerk? Uh, you know what? From what I saw from Aaron Dell, the very limited starts, I was a big fan. You know, I I honestly didn't think there was a drop off between him and Jones. I thought Dell played fantastically. As for Jones, there was a part of me that was a little worried he might have been dealing with something. You know, February, March, April, around the time the Sharks were slumping, just because it seemed like a majority of the goals he was letting in were either five hole or mm-hmm. over the over the shoulder glove side, and it kind of made me wonder if something in that area was affecting him to where he couldn't move it at the at the rate that he would like. But other than that, I mean, I thought Jones was a damn good goalie, and I'm really glad that we have him for another year at such a cheap salary. What do you think he gets when it's time to put the money on the, on the check? I'm thinking it's going to be minimum. I think it's double what he's making now, so $6 million just because he has shown that he can be an elite goalie, especially in the Stanley Cup final Ooh. last year. I know, I know, hot take. But you know what? If he has another good, good year, I would not be surprised. Don't at me. Don't at him. <laughs> I'm adding him right now, actually. I, yeah, I'm about to at you all over the place. <laughs> Go ahead, Zach. Uh, where do we start? I think Martin Jones is an NHL caliber starting goaltender. He is a bona fide number one. To call him elite, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm not sure I can get there. Um, I like this can of worms I just opened. Yeah, the uh, the great work <laughs> by uh, and I'm going to butcher his name, Nick Mercad, uh, and uh, to to help quantify different uh, scoring area danger zones and save percentages thereof. And then Ian Fleming, who makes the save chart that I'm sure all of you see me post constantly about, you know, stacking up goalies, comparing the two on uh, high danger, medium danger, low danger, uh, goal saved against average, et cetera. Um, if you look at Jones overall, he's struggling. And, and this is something we've seen the last couple of years with medium danger shots. He's NHL average at low danger, and he's slightly above the average at high danger. Um, if you're elite, you're honestly, your, your chart looks more like Aaron Dells, who is firmly, uh, to the right of all NHL averages. I'm not saying Aaron Dell is better smaller than sample size. a much smaller sample size. I was going to put every asterisk that any <laughs> of you can type. But what I'm saying is, is that the numbers, the charts, it looks more like that when, when you have, uh, a, a weakness and especially medium danger. You know, that's pretty much the area right outside the home plate area, not quite out to the periphery, to the boards, to the blue line. That's – and it's historical, not just this year. That, that's that been um, a weak point in Martin Jones' game. Um, that's uh, That, to me, does not scream elite. Do I think Martin Jones is a bona fide 65-game starter in the NHL? He can be, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um do I think that he was run down at the end of the season? I certainly think that as well. You know, especially after a long playoff run, the condensed schedule, uh, March being a game, you know, every other day, there was just so much going on there. Um, I think a better deployment plan for Aaron Dell next year, both of those goalies are under contract, is going to go a long way to help keep being Martin Jones fresh and effective when you actually need him. Um you know, a game against the Florida Panthers does not matter if Martin Jones plays that game. It just doesn't. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to convince me of that. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Carolina Hurricanes, don't care. Throw Aaron Dell out there. If he gives up seven, leave him in there. It's a night off for Jones. Does not matter. Um, so I think Martin Jones, uh, and an interesting thing that, that Doug Wilson did share uh, at, at the media day, he said that getting Martin Jones – and Mark Edward Vlasic uh, under the they call he called them crucial to the team's success, and he said getting them signed to extensions uh, this summer is a focal point for the Sharks front office. That doesn't mean they will get done, but if you know as soon as July one hits, if 
if you've got half your team working <laughs> with Mark Edward Vlasic and, and Martin Jones, the other half in, in free agency, that, you know, that's going to be where they're at. They know that those two players, they're, they're slated for a UFA. And if the Sharks lose those two, then, yeah, you, then you can really start talking about a teardown. You really Absolutely. can to me. You know, Mark Edward Vlasic is a number one defender on most other teams in the NHL. Uh, Martin Jones is a bona fide starter. Uh, yeah. Yeah, look, for me, for Martin Jones, for me, I think, like, you know, I, I like Martin Jones. And I know I got in a lot of trouble during the playoffs because Martin Jones led in a lot of bad goals. Now, his overall numbers were fine, but a lot of the goals he let in, man, they were brutal. Um, so I know I got in a lot of trouble for that because people were like, you're blaming Jones. I wasn't blaming Jones. I was just saying he let in a bad goal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Martin Jones is a guy that obviously the, the future, he, he's the guy that's going to start. You're not going to go and, you know, just find another goaltender. Um, so, it, uh, you know, Martin Jones to me, now I'm not a big give the goalie all the money person. So, I mean, if, if he gets five, you know, I, I, if he gets over five, I'm probably kind of annoyed just because I don't want, you know, look at the, the salary cap's not going anywhere. You have players, you know, you have Vlasic that's going to sign. If you're going to give Jones $6 million, I mean, you know, you're going to have trouble filling in those peripheral pieces very quickly. If, if those guys are, you know, you, let's say Vlasic makes seven. Um, let's say, um, <laughs> let's, let's say, Vlasic gets seven. Let's say Jones gets six. I mean, there's, you know, there's $13 million. That's, you know, with on top of Burns already making eight. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to run into depth problems very, very quickly. Um, so I would like to see, you know, um, something lower, uh, something in the five range, less than five would be ideal. But, you know, we'll see what he actually pulls on the open market. Uh, I, I, I'm very much in the, in the sense that, you know, Jones is, you know, he did some, he played like an elite goalie last year. And I think this is where, you know, some people are getting trouble. But I mean, even in the summer, I, you know, I caution people like, okay, but, you know, let's not, let's not anoint this franchise tag on, you know, on him too early. Because, you know, a lot of laughter last season, you know, everyone was talking about, oh, you know, he's the franchise goalie, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, let's, you know, let's roll that back. It's one season. Let's, you know, let's, let's tame that a little bit. And I think this year we were rightfully, you know, doing so. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, that's, that's kind of my take uh, on Martin Jones. I, I hope he doesn't, you know, completely ring the bell because I think that teams that pay their goalies too much have trouble with depth. Um, yeah. Dallas. Yeah. Dallas. Exactly. Dallas. Jeez. Especially for a goalie that isn't truly elite. Yes. Yeah, no, exactly. Like I, I, you know what, between four and five, I'd be ecstatic to get Jones for between four and five. Um, does he get more? Maybe. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see how good his agent is. Um, what do we have next? We have, oh man, expansion draft, uh, RFAs, UFAs, um, trades. What are you guys thinking coming, uh, coming up here? Is that, uh, actually hockey jerk, you've been quiet for a while. Um, what do you think the, the sharks do when it comes to UFAs, RFAs, the whole nine yards? Do they get John Tavares? I hope so. <laughs> it, it, we're, um, let's see, uh, we're about 15 months away from when he's available. So uh, just start the counter now. I'll have the link on my Twitter account. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, just looking, I'm going to leave Thornton and Marlowe out of this conversation just because we kind of already touched on that. But yes, you look at a Melker Carlson who's a restricted free agent, I think for the right dollar, absolutely you bring him back. You know, Zach said earlier, he probably... I love Melker. I do too. You know what? He He's probably the one guy for me that I'm okay with capping around, you know, 30 points just because, you know, he's a solid penalty killer and he's shown he can play anywhere in the lineup, you know? And Chris Tierney, again, yes, he's 22, but we've kind of talked about... You know, it's been a lot of the same the last couple of years, and I personally think a Danny O'Regan or a Brian Carpenter, God willing, he comes back, can step into his spot with no drop off. Mm -hmm. Michael Michael Haley, who's a UFA, you take him or leave him. And Jonas Donskoy, I mean, yes, you know, he had ten million separated shoulders this year, but he he's twenty five, and you kind of wanted him to take some steps this year. I mean, 
obviously kind of difficult, as I said, 10 million separated shoulders, but I think for Jonas Donskoy, I think you do what you did with Matt Nieto, where you give him one year and you see yep. what he can do, and if he doesn't pan out, then <laughs> bye. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Um, decor's locked up, although you know what? Just looking at the decor right now, I really think it's going to be Dylan DeMello who gets claimed by Las Vegas just because he's young, only 23 years old, but he's proven to be an NHL caliber defenseman. Uh, he's got next season at under a million dollars, so it's very affordable for a guy who is a for sure NHL defenseman, as I said before. Um, and then, you know, like a Marcus Sorensen, Mirko Mueller, uh, Joachim Ryan, uh, even a Barkley Goodrow, I see these are all guys who will most likely be brought back in some capacity. Maybe if Barkley Goodrow doesn't want another year in the AHL, I could see him leave. But at the same time, I don't think there's a reason for him to leave. And then Faze, who are on the Barracuda, he, Buddy Robinson, uh, yeah. Ryan Carpenter, Troy Grossnick. These are all guys who you know have excelled in the Barracuda in some capacity this year. And I believe it was Zach last night uh, who said on Twitter, you know, if Heed and Grossnick and all of them want to come back, it's going to be a Royal Rumble for some roster spots for yeah. sure. Especially those three, Carpenter, Grossnick, Heed, I think it would be beneficial for them to move on and find an NHL roster spot on a different team because right. I would say they're all three NHL players and they're not going to be NHL players on this team. And, you know, as for Buddy Robinson, I think he's a guy who benefits from Vegas coming into the NHL because Buddy Agreed. Robinson is a guy you can you he's a guy you can try out in your bottom six, and if he doesn't work out, you can probably sneak him back into the AHL. Yeah. Um. But but I've liked what I saw from him with the Barracuda. He's probably somebody I hope the Sharks can get signed and keep him on the Barracuda because I think I think he's brought a lot um, to the team. Zach, what are your thoughts for off-season transactions and whatnot? So I'm going to try to do this rapid-fire style. Uh, Carlson at 1.65. I think that's a very uh, good deal. He's an RFA. I wouldn't. I'd be fine with him going to around two. Um, I think he's just very, very versatile. Don Skoy, I think with the injured year, uh, probably helps the Sharks save a little bit. Um, in his RFA negotiations, but I would 100% bring him back. Chris Tierney, you know, he's an RFA. I, I again, I just feel his skill set. You know, he's an NHLer for sure, but I feel like the the Barracuda offer that down below as well. Um, so those are those are the RFAs. Michael Haley, uh, give or take. Um, I, I think that there's a a, uh, a non-zero chance that he's back with the Sharks, but it'll be interesting what they do there. Um, Armalis is gone. He's going to head back to Europe. Sorensen uh, is a uh, – and Armalis is an RFA. Uh, Sorensen, I think, 100% the Sharks are going to look to try to keep in the fold. It'll be interesting what that contract looks like. Uh, you know, he's 25, so mm -hmm. he might be a little bit pricier uh, to, to keep around as he's – uh, likely going to have you know opportunities in Europe as well. Uh, interesting that nobody's really talked about this, including us. Mirko Mueller's an RFA. So what do you do there on a on a player that's really kind of quickly getting leapfrogged on your depth chart as a former first overall pick? That's that's going to be an interesting one. That might be a bargaining chip. Uh, that expansion bait. You know, yeah, you know, and. Uh, that way, you know, Patrick Benali, RFA, he's been stepped over by DeSimone and, uh, and Middleton. So that, uh, you know, he, he's a, a minor leaguer. I don't see him doing much. We've talked about Heed. Uh, I totally agree with Jerk. Buddy Robinson's a really interesting player. Uh, you know, at, at that size, that's, you know, he's got all the check boxes. It's just putting it together. And I think he's, I mean, he's looked as good as I've ever seen him. I didn't see him too much when he was out east, but I you know, caught him here and there. Uh, you know, you put him with a real responsible center like Rourke Chartier and just kind of let him loose on that wing. You know, I I agree with Jerk. You know, he's going to be contending for a, an NHL roster spot, 
And it'll be interesting if he, like Ryan Carpenter um, and Troy Grosnick and Tim Heed, by extension, um, kind of really take their time and look at their options and maybe see who signs where and where their best opportunity is. Um, Grosnick, I think, uh, um, you know, is going to sign elsewhere. And then down at the bottom, you have Zach uh, Sortini and, and Dan Kelly, which, um, you know, they're they're good character guys. They're good locker room guys. But at this point, they're probably, um, you know, stuck as AHL it's players. Room. Yeah. And, and so do they even go somewhere else where it's like they have, they have zero chance for a call-up, you know, zero. Um, you know, why the heck not? And as far as expansion goes, uh, I'm firmly that the, the, the Sharks are going to lose a defender. You're going to have Mirko Mueller, Dylan DeMello, uh, Brendan Dillon exposed for sure, uh, and Paul Martin, just, just for yep. sake of argument. And then it comes down to what Doug Wilson does for his draft strategy or his protection strategy with Burns, Vlasic, Braun and Schlemko. I think there's a good. I think there's there's a chance that they protect Schlemko, uh, mm -hmm. just for estate planning. Looking at those contracts that they're going to have to get done, you know, Vlasic's going to get six easily six plus million a year, without batting an eye. Martin Jones, you're probably talking in the five ish neighborhood to bring back, and that money's got to come from somewhere in the salary cap system. Yep. So, um. If, if I had to pick, I think that if Braun is ex – I think whoever is exposed out of Braun and Schlemko, if they go with the 7-3, is the selection. And if they somehow go eight skaters and – Up think top, though, just uh, not, not to cut you off, but up top, though, I mean, I think uh, up top is going to be interesting, too, though, because the because they're going to have – they still have to expose a certain number of players that meet the criteria. And which they will. Means that, which they will, I think. And I think that, you know, there might be some interesting players up there to Vegas too, I think. Like, I don't think they're going to they're gonna roll the dice on a Bodker $4 million deal. But I I expose Chris Tierney, and I think Chris Tierney could easily get snatched up. So, and over at, some, Go for it, Jerry. Sorry. I just want to say something else to consider is that of the um, forwards the Sharks have, Yannick Hansen is the only one that they have to protect. Correct. No move, no trade clause. Everybody else, they theoretically don't have to protect. So it gives them a little more flexibility in protecting their decor if they do want to go the eight skater route. But again, not ideal. But Actually, you're not going <laughs> to. Sorry, go ahead. Hansen can be exposed. No, Doug Wilson's uh, made it sound like it was a part of the trade that he wouldn't be exposed when he waved as no. Um, that might be a handshake deal, but they have nobody that they're mandated to to protect. He said uh, exactly that to, at the media day. Oh, okay. Ah, well, there you go. Forget everything I just said. Forget it. <laughs> well, well, that's not to say it's, it's like I, I would not be shocked whatsoever if Doug Wilson and Joe Thornton have a July first handshake deal. That, that I would agree with that. Yeah, that yeah. would that would surprise me about as much as the sun coming up in the east tomorrow morning. <laughs> no doubt. That's, that's how shocking that would be to me. Um, so, so real quick, I have uh, planmyteam.com has a great simulator. Okay. I'm one of their experts over there, so go check out my team and all the other teams, and you can play around with all the expansion draft. Warning, it will take you like all night. It's so addicting. Um, for the Sharks, the the forwards that they that uh, they have out of their protection list. Barclay Goodrow, Buddy Robinson, Chris Tierney, Yannick Hansen, Joe Pavelski, Joe Thornton, Joel Ward, Logan Couture, Melker Carlson, Michael Haley, Michael Bodker, Patrick Marleau, Ryan Carpenter, Tomas Hurdle, Zach Sortini. Those are the only players, only forwards, that are uh, exposable. And then it's pretty much, you know, everyone we talked about on defense. It's Dylan Burns, right. Schlemko, DeMello, Braun Vlasic, Mueller, Martin Kelly. Uh, Yoakam Ryan, Tim Heed, all those guys are protected already. Mm -hmm. um, and then on defense, obvious, or excuse me, in Cole, it's Jones, Dell, Grosnick, and Martin Jones. That was the one player, like I said, Doug Wilson Ryan. gave us. Martin Jones will be protected. So, you know, from there, um, I actually have Chris Tierney getting protected. I have their only exposed players. That are you know serviceable. Joel Ward, 
Goudreau, and Carpenter. But Carpenter is also uh, UFA. Uh, UFA. So, you know, I don't. I, I think he's safe from expansion, but. Yeah, because why are you gonna if you're an expansion team? Why are you gonna why are you gonna waste a pick on a UFA if you if you couldn't get them under contract when you have your window? It doesn't make sense. Right. So realistically, the only forwards that are under contract and draftable, in 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 my model, is Joel Ward, because yeah. they're gonna protect Tierney, Hansen, Pavelski, Couture, Carlson, Bodker, Hurdle. So. You know, is it Joel? Like, which player do you would you rather have, Joel Ward or David Schlemko? Joel Schlemko. Ward or Dylan Demello? Dylan Demello. Joel Ward, Brendan Dylan. Now and uh, but, but that's my point. We're already we're, we're on choice number three. And, and, okay, so you had to pause there. Joel Ward or Mirko Mueller? Uh, Neither. Neither, yeah. I'm just fire yeah. bolt into the sun. And then Joel Ward or Paul Martin? Paul Martin. Fire them both into the sun. Well, at least Jerk gave real answers. All right, well, I'm sorry. I can't fire them <laughs> North Korea, I thought, we, I thought we could send people into the sun, North Korea. All right. We're, we're doctors. We're not nuclear scientists. Yeah. Okay, it was a theme here. We're in an autopsy. Right. Okay. My bad. Um, <laughs> let me just go through this list quick because I because we're running long even for even for this um, stylish show, which we knew was going to be longer. We um, warned everybody. Yes, we, we we did warn everyone. Um, you know, I, I I'm going to echo a lot of things. Obviously, look at our malice is gone. I bring Sorensen back. I bring both Don Squay and Carlson back. Uh, both aren't going to take very much to resign. And so I think that the the risk reward, you know, short contract, um, buy Don Scoy some new shoulders, you know, <laughs> robotic shoulders, and and he'll be fine. I expose Chris Tierney in the expansion draft, and if no one takes him, then I, you know, again, uh, maybe a short deal there. I don't, I hate just letting an RFA walk for nothing. I think Chris Tierney has value, and you would want to get something. You don't want to just let them walk for nothing. Uh, Mirko, I, you know what? I probably, I think they resigned Mirko. Um, you know, Mirko shocked me when he got called up um, ahead of some of the guys he got called up for. Um, so obviously the Sharks still see something there. So Mirko Mueller getting resigned would not shock me at all. Also wouldn't shock me to see a team like Vegas take a flyer on him because he's cheap and, you know, they, they do need to build some back end as well. Uh, Patrick McNally, I think, is is probably done. He does have arbitration rights, but I don't think it's going to matter. Um, Tim Heed is gone. Uh, Buddy Robinson, I would like to have back, but, you know, uh, again, we don't know. Uh, Yoakam Ryan, you absolutely bring back. Uh, I bring back Yev Palofs, um for the right amount of money. I think there's still... There's still upside there. I really like, you know, he's obviously not going to be the 100 point guy in the queue, but he has this real Swiss army knifeness about him that I really, really like. Um, so I would definitely see if you can build on that. Um, Carpenter's gone. Grosnick's probably gone. Stratini and, and, and Kelly, look, you know, you, you don't need these guys. There's going to be, you've got so many guys that are coming over. We don't know if Noah Rod's going back next year. Um, we don't know if any, oh, is he? Okay. Uh, is, you know, uh, there's probably other people that, you know, other prospects that are going to come. Look at Dan Kelly. Do you really want Dan Kelly to be taking ice time away from Jeremy Waugh? Not me. Or Kevin Fitzgerald. Or you're Kevin Fitzgerald. Exactly. Like, there's that blue line is going to be so log jammed next year that. You know, even with with Tim Hid likely being gone, you know, you want to get Jeremy Wine there. Plain you're telling simple. me you're telling me you don't want to bring back discount Roman Pollock? No, I don't. <laughs> um, what kind of deal do you think Yoakam Ryan gets? Because he's an RFA as well. Yoakam Ryan probably gets another two way deal though. So something yeah, more? I would say though. Yeah. I yeah. could honestly, I could see with Ryan, I could see them go the Grossnick route where year one is a two way, year two is a one way. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, I, that's that's what I think too. Um, let's take a look here. Okay, anything, uh, 
any any anything found around who's who's coming who who is who who do you expect to see in Barracuda camp next uh, next spring, Zach? Just because I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, I mean, there's a number of players that are going to be forced to to turn professional one way or the other. One of them is Jeremy Waugh, uh, second round pick in 2015. Cost quite a bit to trade up with Tampa Bay to get him, uh, mm -hmm. but he'll be uh, he'll be turning pro. Uh, as well as Kevin Fitzgerald. Uh, both of those are QMJHL defenders uh, that will be uh, aging out of the CHL. E from there, um, realistically, it comes down to Rudolph Bowkers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's he's going to be an overager. Um, Manuel Werder as well. Uh, those are all players that are going to be aging out of the CHL. So, uh, those are guys that, that they're going to have to find homes with. I did speak with Manuel Werder's camp. He was the fifth round pick uh, in 2016. He's in San Jose, and uh, discussions are already underway. Um, so that is uh, something of interest there. Um, so they're looking real hard at, at getting him under contract. He'll probably be with the Barracuda. Um, Joachim Blitzfeld probably is going back to uh, to Portland. He was a, a key cog there. He'll be even more important as that young team grows. Dylan Gambro is, is interesting. I'm, I, I, I think he's probably going to return to the University of Denver. I feel like if he would have signed, it would have already happened by now. Um, so I, I, you know, I've got no intel on that, but it's it's just a feeling. Um, Latunov's returning for another year of school. Right. It's, he, he's in that, that same camp. Um, hockey jerk is wrong. Jamie Murray won't be with the Barracuda next year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, he, I guess he could be. I, I really think the Barracuda have two new cold tenders. Um, you know, do they in. bring back? Do they bring back the Bumblebee? Um, probably not. I, I've not been wildly impressed, but Nabokov has done some great work. Uh, you know, Armalis for all the slings and arrows cast at him. Uh, I think he's improved greatly. I think Hedberg and Nabokov have done some great work with Grosnick as well as his hard work over the summer. Um, Parker Gahagan is still on the Sharks radar. I'm told, uh, there's quite a few things that I can't get into that are holding that up. Um, but it's not for lack of interest on both sides. Um, so maybe, um, but you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I, for, for me, the Sharks really have to address goaltending this, this, uh, this off season organizationally. Um, yes. the Barracuda need at least one more goaltender, no matter what, uh, ideally you would like to have one down in the ECHL. So let's, let's, let's say Dr. Jerk is right. And uh, Jamie Murray comes up. You'd still like to have somebody developing down there at the ECHL level, getting some starts, getting used to the pro game. Um, so you need one goalie for the, the one goalie at the ECHL level, one goalie for the AHL level, and then after that, I mean, it's Jake Cupsey has not looked good at Union. Mike Robinson has had a dismal start, uh, you know, uh, draft plus one and draft plus two year. There's nothing uh, promising there as far as his underlying stats or, or where his progression is going. Sharks are going to pick somewhere around 20 probably. I wouldn't mind reaching and taking uh, Jake Ottinger at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw him this summer out at, at the NJEC. He's big. He's smart. Um, you know, As a true freshman, walked into Boston University and stole that job. Um, that's a player that I'd really like to see uh, the Sharks look uh, at with that first round pick because and, and and this is coming from somebody that generally hates the idea of goalies in a first in the first round. I'm very much there with you. Right. Yep. Same as well. But I'm I'm looking at the organizational need. Goalies are a four to five six year window anyway. You know, five years down the road. Martin Jones is 33. Right. You know, that's that's just planning. So the Sharks have to get some prospects in here that have NHL upside. As much as as, as impressive as Aaron Dell is, I'm not sure he's an NHL starter. 
And and I don't think that's a slight. Even being a backup in the NHL is amazing. Um, oh, I agree. Yeah, no, I mean, I've always been of that camp. Yeah. Um, so I, I, and especially, you know, with the second, third, and fourth where you, and that's that's why I would, I wouldn't mind chasing Jake Ottinger at, at one, at, you know, pick number 20. Because you're not going to be able to wrap back around at two and get like a Maxim Zukov out of the USHL with the second round pick. That That's not going to happen. There's no second round pick right now. Right. Doug Wilson, Doug Wilson might be cooking something up, you know, uh, he's famous for his phone calls. I'm sure he's going to make them. Um, Primo, if he's there in the, yeah, Primo, uh, Kane and Primo, I'd probably take earlier than the fifth. Um, we have no choice. (laughs) Yeah. One guy I, I, you know, the Sharks have three seventh round picks and a guy that I've really liked. That's a a net minder. He plays for the Victoria Royals. I've seen quite a bit of him is Griffin outhouse. I, you know, he's not the biggest guy, but, I really like uh, his game, and if that's an overager, you've got to see two years of him uh, in the WHL. Uh, you know that would be a guy I wouldn't mind taking a flyer on, with you know, say Ottawa, you know, Ottawa's seventh round pick or something like right. that, because they're they're still in it. They're going to be a, that's going to be a worse seventh round pick than the Sharks. That's true. Yes, Chris, I've been talking about Outhouse for a while. I've been pumping him up since last year. I couldn't believe he didn't get drafted. Well, there we go. All right. Um, you know what? I think I'm going <laughs> to call it there since uh, I, I see started streaming two hours ago. So um, thank you for, for sitting through this wonderful autopsy of, of autopsies. I think we pulled all the organs out onto the table. We checked them all over. Um, and, you know, it's it is what it is i hope that this was informative i hope that you know you sat here and listened and said man those guys are dumb or man those guys are great or just you know man i didn't even consider that and if you did any of those things then we've done our job um friday night we will be on after the barracuda game uh sunday we will be on after the barracuda game and i do want to try and fit some of these type of shows in where we actually talk about nhl things uh as well um so Thank you for watching. Uh, I'm going to go around the table and get some final thoughts, and uh, then we were going to get the hell out of here. Um, Mr. Hockey Jerk, final thoughts. Where can we find you, and are you thinking that these Sharks will be better next year, the same or worse? Well, you know, we've we've done our you know, we've done our paperwork as, you know, we are all doctors here, you know. We've made cuts. We've made decisions, and you know what? This team... <laughs> Uh, I don't think they'll be better next year if they are. <laughs> if they are, pull up this episode and just send it to my Twitter every day next, <laughs> next season. Um, I think they'll be around the same. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, they've still got some big guys not named Thornton and Marlow, and I think that's going to be key for the operation next year. No pun intended, of course. And, uh, as for what I'm up to, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at hockey underscore jerk. Um, we just recorded the final episode of the Pucknologists podcast. I believe we recorded it Monday night, and it came out yesterday. I think I, yesterday. All, yeah, all my days are running together. I'll be honest with you, but um, <laughs> episode number twenty six. Twenty six. It is the last one of the season. So myself, Rocket, and AJ will. You know, be on vacation, going to the beach. Uh, I think we have a zip lining day trip planned. That's going to be fun. Um, so for that project, we'll be back. But as for this project, TTG Reborn, I hope that um, Ian accepts my desire to move up from a PTO to a real contract. In that case, you'll see me a lot more. <laughs> um, back to you, Ian. Uh, Zach, same thing, same question. I think the Sharks will be a similar team next season with an improved result. Um, I'm not sure if they're, you know, to call them a a Stanley Cup contender might be a stretch, but are they going to be able to make some noise in the playoff? And, hey, if lightning, you know, catch lightning in a bottle, why the heck not? If Carolina can do it for a year, why not San Jose? Um, You know, the – I think the pieces will be there for, for at least another kick at the old Stanley Cup can. Um, but, 
yeah, it, next year is the last year. I think after that, you really do have to really take a hard look at you know what pieces are there moving forward. Um, I would probably extend uh, Doctor Jerk that uh, that that contract, Ian. I, I, I think it's I'm thinking so. Yeah, but uh, you know, hey, I mean, you, you know, you're. You're our GM, so ultimately the decision is up to you. I'm just your humble scout. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Um, where can they find your stuff? Oh, I've got a ton of stuff coming all, out all over the Twitters. Um, so follow me at Zach the Bear, A -Z, uh, at Z A K K T H E B E A R. Um, my April draft rankings are up over at thehockeyprofits.com. Go check those out. Uh, I've just been doing daily data dumps onto the hockeywriters.com on everything for the Sharks, and I will be traveling out to uh, Stockton to cover the uh, the San Jose Barracuda versus Stockton Heat this Friday and Sunday, joining the Barracuda After Dark in progress with some news from the Barracuda uh, locker room. Uh, I'm Ian Reed. I think that the sharks are stuck in a purgatory of sorts. I think that um, yeah, I think they'll be you know about the same next year. Probably a better result just because you'd hope people would be less injured. But um, pain's coming for this team, guys. It's it's coming. It might not be next year. It might not be the year after. But it's it's coming. Um, but soon. Yes. Yeah. Pain pain's coming. Unfortunately. Um, other than that, though, uh, you can follow. We have a, a Twitter for the show at uh, TTG Reborn, um, and what I'm trying to do on there is basically make that your one stop stop for anything that any of us are doing uh, and a, a part of the the TTG team. Which, um, for those that uh, don't know who like I have in mind for this whole team, that's obviously Zach. It's Hockey Jerk. It's Kevin. It's myself. It's Joe. Uh, so anytime any of us do something, I'm gonna make sure that it's on that TTG. Um, that Twitter feed. So if you want all your TTG hosts doing goings on in one place, check out that Twitter. Um, you can also follow me at Ian Vlogs Hockey. Um, I will be writing on Teal Town USA, um, and you know, otherwise just being here talking into my camera on YouTube. Other than that, guys, thanks again so much. I know this was a long show, so thanks for sticking through it, and have yourselves a excellent night.